1,000 children attended Sunday school. Can you imagine that? <laughs> Even though his ministry was thriving, he was growing physically and emotionally tired. In 1863, in the midst of the Civil War, people's spirits were dying. As most everyone was grieving over someone who had been killed or was um, greatly wounded in the war. He found it really difficult to write and deliver inspirational messages to a people who wanted to hear words of hope and peace. And when the war ended, Brooks thought that the spirit was going to be renewed. He was able to give spiritual inspirational messages again. But that pain only increased when President Lincoln was assassinated and he was asked to speak at Lincoln's funeral. Brooks decided to go on sabbatical to the Holy Land. And while he was there, he borrowed a horse, and he rode through the desolate country uh, between Jerusalem and Bethlehem, just to be alone and to have some peace. When he arrived in Bethlehem, he just observed the first stars and recalled the story of Jesus' birth. He attended the Christmas Eve service of Constantine's old basilica, built over the traditional site of the birthplace of Jesus. He was so deeply moved by this this service. And that experience stayed with him, with, with him throughout his life. When he got back from his sabbatical, he felt invigorated and his quote, hope renewed. And he struggled to find the words that describe such an inspirational, just such a wonderful experience. As he prepared for his Christmas of 1868, he recalled riding into Bethlehem at dusk and the church service that followed. And this time, the words came easily, and he wrote the poem. He then gave it to Redner, who struggled to find words, or find music to match these, and had written it during the night, and he finished it in the morning, and it was on that Christmas morning that the little town of Bethlehem was sung. So let us now sing the first and fourth verse of the 144 of old little town of
So every time now that since I've heard his sermon and his description of his experience there, it puts a whole different light on it. It came upon the midnight crew. In 1849, Dr. Evan Sears, a Unitarian minister from Massachusetts, was writing a Christmas Eve message for his congregation. Again, in the midst of the Civil War, the debate over slavery plus the poverty of his community had again, once again, this author's had shed, his spirit was shattered. He tried desperately to find words that would inspire his congregation. Dr. Sears cared deeply for humanity and he took his, serious, his call, Jesus' call, seriously to help the least of these. So he helped those living in the slums who had little or no help. He felt others weren't as caring as he was to reach out and help others in need. As he struggled to write his sermon, the words in Luke 2, verses 8 and 9 inspired him. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby. He watched over their flocks by night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. Well, the message the angels brought was filled with hope and joy and peace and the depth of God's love for all. He was so moved by the miraculous and amazing event that he wrote this five-verse poem called It Came Upon a Midnight Clear and combined it with a Christmas poem he had written ten years earlier to write his short sermon. Today it's considered a joyful song, but when his audience first heard it, they might have seen it as a charge or a challenge. Sears wanted his congregation to celebrate Christmas, but he also wanted them to reflect on how they could reach out to the poor in order to do something to change the social issues around them. He wanted them to understand that God greatly needed people to help make the changes. Let us sing on number 153, verses 1, 3, and 4. It came upon a midnight clear. <laughs>
Oxford on time. For almost 1,500 years, the observation of Jesus' birth was not recognized by the common folk, but left to religious men or monks who lived a hard and demanding life, working in poverty and serving people who didn't m much understand about the scriptures or spiritual life. Monks lived a solitary life, giving up their family to serve the people of God. Back then, they were, only, they were often the only ones who told of Jesus' birth, and their lives were the only example of, of how to live a Christian life. This carol was first sung in the 19th century in France, and believed to have been written by someone, possibly a monk or a priest in the Catholic Church, who had a prolific knowledge of the Bible and an unbelievable gift for taking the scripture and putting it to verse. For many biblical scholars, the angels coming to lowly shepherds who worked in fields and informing them of the birth of God's Son symbolized that Jesus came for all people, rich or poor, humble or powerful. For it would be to the common person and not kings or religious leaders who would be the first ones to share the story of Jesus' life to the people. The simplicity of the tune seems to indicate that these were early chants sung by the monks in order to teach the people. As people, as few people read words, much less music, it helped them to keep the message of the gospel alive. This carol is one of few uh, that fully describe the joy that the world felt when Jesus was born, and it reminds us to remember to spread the gospel. Angels we have heard on high number 155 verses 1 and 4. <laughs> Educated African Americans in the South, 
work felt that the younger generation of blacks could better understand how important spirituality was to them by learning the songs their ancestors sang during slavery. Work passed his love of music and history on to his son, John Worth II, a singer, composer, collector of black spirituals, and a history professor at this university who saved a large number of black folk songs from being lost. The song came from a slave who was inspired by the Christmas story. With no hope of freedom and probably unable to read a Bible, the author seemed to imagine the emotions the shepherds and as felt as the angels appeared to them. Most African American songs focused on pain and suffering and their and the deep connection with God through all of that. This song, however, is a joyful song that embraced the wonder of ordinary shepherds whose hearts were deeply moved by Jesus' birth. Let us sing number 167, verses 1 and 3 only. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 